Good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Bremer. And uh, for those of you uh, that are here with us bright and early for the kickoff of the formal sessions at this year's annual meeting, uh, this is the right session for you to come to. Uh, it is about uh, deglobalization or reglobalization. But what that really means is it's a different title for uh, the theme, the annual theme of the meeting this year, which is can we have cooperation um, given global fragmentation? And uh, we have a great panel to discuss that, uh, one of whom is going to be here uh, during my introduction in all likelihood. Uh, so one thing I would say, one of the things that kind of uh, challenges me uh, in talking about shifts towards deglobalization as a political scientist is how overdetermined it is. And I'm hoping that one of the things we can do with our panel is unpack it a bit. We've heard a lot about polycrisis, uh, and our friend Adam has been talking about that quite a bit recently. Um, this idea that it's really just a moment in unfortunate time with massive levels of enormous disruption coming from pandemic um, and Russian war um, on top of underlying climate conditions, extraordinary fiscal uh, responses, and the rest. And wouldn't that lead to also unprecedented levels uh, of transitory deglobalization? Political scientists like me have been talking about cyclical structural shifts in the global order. The idea that we are in a geopolitical recession, that the institutions globally increasingly don't align with the global balance of power. And as that is true with the Chinese as a state capitalist, uh, second largest economy in the world, the United States focused more inwards given its political divisions, the Russians as a rogue, you put all of those things together, wouldn't you get a structural piece of deglobalization that occurs until you come out of that bust cycle? And then finally, the economists, who also see this as structural in some way, um, which is that you know, globalization has gotten extraordinary gains um, as the world has taken advantage of these massive efficiencies of you know, differential labor rates. Um, and suddenly, um, they're much more competitive. Um, and they're much more expensive. And indeed, we see with technologies, labor becoming less important uh, to capital investment. So wouldn't that lead um, to a degree of structural deglobalization until that plays out. I suspect all three of these are true, but all three of these are not equally explanatory, and our panel will have other ideas as well. So with that, who do we have? Well, first, we have the non-existent Hungarian Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Peter Zarto, who I will turn to not first. <laughs> then uh, we have Adam Tews, we have Nairi Woods, and we have Neil Ferguson, all of whom I am virtually certain are very well personally known to every single person sitting in this room right now. So with that, let me go in that order, uh, skipping over the Hungarian. Adam, tell me, of those three and any others you'd like to go through, what's driving the shift in trajectory on globalization that we see right now? Yeah, I mean, I like your, your connection of this theme with the polycrisis idea, because I think the, what we do have to wrap our heads around is the conjunction in a particular moment of really very diverse and sort of incohate almost factors which don't reduce to a common denominator. So I would simply pick two. One is the, not exhaustion, but the plateau reached, for instance, in the supply chain story. There were just these gains to be made in particular sectors, notably, for instance, internal combustion driven motor vehicles, which generated huge more regional than truly global, but nevertheless, they show up in the trade statistics as globalization drivers. That reaches a certain plateau, and now we're really undergoing a major gear shift, which suggests quite a new pattern of division of labor in the automotive sector, which will, which will change that statistical story. At the other end of the spectrum, in terms of the sort of driver, so that's a structural, technological, microeconomic story, or an industrial economic story. At the other end of the spectrum, in terms of drivers in the current moment, I, you know, I would double down on the geopolitics of the chip wars, because that seems to me a vector of deglobalization, which has a very different kind of force field to it. And you, know, you can go back and forth on the, in the blame game here, but what we are clearly witnessing right now is a concerted effort by the, to mobilize the resources of the American state apparatus to strike against individual private companies or companies which in some sense, and at least like Huawei, are private actors, though of course they're entangled with the Chinese state. 
and then to go up and down the supply chain for this vital technology and just in a surgical way strike at China's capacity to achieve imports of those. Now, that is a very different process of deglobalization from the other one. One final point I would make is that these processes of deglobalization, I think, and potentially reglobalization, have to be set within something which me and other historians tend to call the global condition, which is the state of interrelatedness that doesn't change whether or not you repolarize it in positive or negative terms. I mean, I was joking over Brexit, so it's a little bit like a sexual taboo. The more you try to not think about it, the more you end up thinking about it. So when you are building the structures of a great firewall to keep the outside out, are you deglobalizing or in some sense actually obsessing about the other that sits there? And that can have long-term effects. In due course, you know less about the outside world, obviously, and that can then induce genuine decoupling but in the meantime, I would think of it rather as a sort of negatively polarized interaction. And I think distinguishing those three different levels is a useful way, perhaps, of getting a handle on this incredibly complex situation. Now, before I turn to Nairi, I want to ask you, um, in the next 10 years, um, if we were to talk on a spectrum from deglobalization to reglobalization, where do you place yourself on that? What are your expectations? Just quickly. A new cocktail, a new, a new pattern, a new, a new way in which those relationships are structured. I don't actually expect serious deglobalization on the trade metric, on the foreign direct investment level. That seems highly implausible to me. But we'll be talking about globalization very differently in terms of the things that are part of it, is what you're saying. Uh, we will still be talking about it, I think. Yes, indeed. OK, Nairi. Yeah, I think the chip wars are really interesting because I don't, I'm not so clear that it's a straight deglobalization story. I think the idea that you have massive government investment, trade protections to build an industry, which then, if we look at the US in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s on tech, relied on huge markets to get the quantity through that permitted you to really drive into you know, high quality chips. So, so I think it's a, it's a combination. I think that, that the big investments into, into chips are investments in companies that want global markets, yes. but they'll be separate spheres. It'll be like the Cold War, so you'll have yes. two separate spheres in which agree. each are pushing for, for markets. But I, I want to take a step back and sort of and think about three foundations of globalization that we've been seeing crumble, because I think that helps us to see what it would take if you wanted to try to um, you know, engage a new, a new uh, decade of globalization. And, and the first is obviously the social compact, right? The fact that globalization was born with, with a view that you needed the consent of the people for globalization. So protective policies at home enabling a globalizing policy abroad. And we've seen that social compact crumble with people rallying around the banner of take back control. And that tells you that that social contract has, has crumbled. The second is the hegemon, the role of the leader in the system, where you need a leader, in, in Kindleberger's famous words, that's willing and able to actually set the rules, enforce the rules, mobilize a coalition of countries to abide by the rules to some degree. And that leadership of a set of open global rules has crumbled. And there's no obvious leader stepping forward to take its place. Who knows? It might be a coalition. It might be Indonesia and India together yes. yeah. that step forward um, uh, to, to, to set new rules. Or they might be regional. But I think that's the, the second thing that's crumbled. And the third thing that's crumbled for business and, and firms is a balancing of rights and duties, a balancing of freedom and responsibility that that if you're going to go global, if we're going to have global supply chains, you, have, you do have responsibilities as well as the rights and freedoms to go abroad and find the cheapest prices, the cheapest workers, the cheapest factories. You must take with you responsibilities, whether it's for the environment, for the communities in which you work, uh, for um, you know, human rights and such like. And that got you know, we, the, the world globalized quickly in terms of opening up market, market opportunities, but governments were very, very slow to follow up with entrenching and expecting the responsibilities and duties that went with those freedoms and, and, and rights. And I think that, that also has eroded. So those three foundations, the leadership, the social compact with people, 
and the, the balancing of rights and duties for firms, we've seen crumble. That doesn't mean they can't be rebuilt, but those are the three things, in my view, that need to be rebuilt if you're going to start trying to put back um, a new global order. And same follow-up question to you, uh, remembering that Adam was more towards stronger globalization but different definitions. In 10 years, you'd be where? So I think in 10 years, sorry, and uh, in w one other thing is there are some parts of the world that don't have a choice about whether they globalize mm. or don't globalize. So I look at the continent of Africa and the fact that as the rest of the world is talking about industrial policy and mm. you know, closing, closing the doors, the countries of Africa are moving towards a continental free trade agreement. They don't have a choice. They require global markets, not just for food imports or other imports, mm. but also so to export what they produce. So in my view, in 10 years' time, we'll see a world of, of areas of globalization that sit under a political security umbrella. OK. And Neil, uh, please. Well, I have to confess I don't like the word polycrisis. Uh, I'm, I'm with Gideon Rachman on this. It makes me think of polystyrene and polyester, things that I never much liked. And I'm also somewhat skeptical of, of geopolitical recession as a term. I mean, this is just history. It's just how history works. You get stuff uh, that uh, is not so perceptible, the economic convergence, the technological change, which were obviously going to alter the way the global economy worked. You had a financial crisis in 2008-09. You've had a populist protectionist backlash, which kind of went from 2016 to 2019. Then you have had Cold War II from about 2018 between the US and China, a pandemic, and then a war in Eastern Europe. But this is history happening. And it would be surprising if there weren't structural changes in the way the world economy worked under those circumstances. I think we need to be careful about this term globalization. We talk about it without specifying what we mean. So let's be clear. Global trade relative to global output has flatlined or somewhat declined. And you can point to a peak somewhere after the financial crisis. Global capital flows are definitely down in relative terms, probably peaked out in 20, 2007. Uh, if you look at migration, you could argue that there was a peak there. Uh, and of course, <laughs> globalization is partly cultural. The days of of the dominance of American culture are clearly in the rearview mirror. So I would say you could, you could make an argument that globalization peaked somewhere around about 2007. Except that, as Richard Baldwin has pointed out, there's a lot of, I don't know, there's a lot of um, confusion, in fact, when you look at the statistics that he, I think, rightly points out should make us skeptical about the idea that deglobalization is really going on. It, it hasn't peaked in Europe. I mean, there hasn't been some kind of peak in trade, certainly within the European Union, between the member countries. A lot of what appears to be a peak in globalization followed by a plateau or decline just has to do with price movements. I mean, Baldwin's absolutely right. Huge distortion is created by this commodity super cycle, which peaks in sort of 2010, 11. And then that's really part of what's driving uh, the numbers. There has not been a peak in the globalization of services. If you're talking about trade and goods, yes. But the globalization of trade and services just keeps on, keeps on going. And if you read the URF Financial Times this morning, you'll see just how little deglobalization has really altered Apple's business model. It is still basically designed in California and assembled in China. They've gone from 100% of the iPhones to like 90%. So there's a trend there. But the idea that this is deglobalization seems to me to be a classic example of a journalistic narrative that people inhale because it kind of intuitively makes sense that so we had peak globalization, now it's in, re in recession or retreat. Then you look at the data and it's not there. It's really not there. So you're going to ask me the follow-up question. I'll spare you the effort. Thank you. There's, this is all a mirage. There is not a major deglobalization going on here. There are, there are clearly shifts and changes. But let's just take one example. The huge shock disruptive effect of the war. Uh, you would think that's hugely reduced uh, Russia's trade with, <laughs> say, Europe. But you'd be wrong. Yeah. Actually, in dollar terms or euro terms, it's gone up. 
because the prices, the prices yeah. of the Russian exports have gone up. So I would just caution against this whole narrative of deglobalization. I think is mostly an illusion, like the poly crisis. Now that, the, the poly crisis, that's a little mean, but that's OK. Uh, you know, we didn't come here to just be nice to you. You're professionally disagreeable. We understand that. We love that about you, Neil. Now, before, I'm going to ask for later interventions to be shorter so we can get more of them. But um, to our friend from Hungary, um, what I've been asking everyone, you can probably assess it, um, is to what extent we think that the primary drivers of deglobalization to the extent that we've seen it or not seen it, as Neil is suggesting, um, are coming from the poly crisis that may not exist, um, the, uh, fr from political structural factors or economic structural factors. Give us a couple of moments on how you respond to that. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I uh, really do apologize. Uh, I didn't want to be um, impolite to any of you, but uh, for some reason, uh, the Civic Aviation Authority wanted us to see Zurich at least three times from the air, so before uh, our landing. So uh, that's why we are late for a couple of minutes. I really apologize uh, for that. Well, um, I'm coming from a um, rather small or mid sized landlocked country, which, um, uh, which does not really have uh, natural um, resources but has uh, one of the most open economy in the world, at least among the top 10. And in the meantime, we are somewhere geographically, somewhere between East and West, namely, we are located in uh, Central Europe. So uh, for us, for us Hungarians, for us Central Europeans, a pragmatic and rational uh, cooperation based on mutual respect and trust between the East and West uh, is, is uh, absolutely in our interest. So it's our national economic interest, but even more than that, it's our national security interest that East and West can talk to each other and can cooperate uh, to some extent. Now, until um, the beginning of last year, that was uh, kind of a likely scenario. But uh, as we were approaching the end of la end of uh, sorry end of 2021, I mean, so by the end of 2021, that was a kind of likely scenario. East and West could work together. From the beginning of 2022, uh, it became more and more obvious that there's going to be a huge, let's say, truck uh, in this uh, possible cooperation, and um, this is the worst possible news for the region where I'm uh, coming from, given the fact that the, um, that the confrontation uh, between blocks based on geography is always bad for those who are geographically in the middle. And we Central Europeans have been in the, in the middle uh, during the Cold War, where uh, we were losers of the Cold War. And now we are in the middle of something what I'm I'm afraid it will be again called as Cold War 2.0 or something like that, although we wish it would not happen. But this is, this is really a really bad news for us because the Eurasian principle or the idea of Eurasian cooperation used to be a very good basis for the economic development in Europe. And now, obviously, uh, this uh, is now only a dream, a faraway dream, and far away from, um, from reality. On the other hand, what I think was another problem when it comes to something what we call globalization, although I would be really surprised if you would agree on a definition of what it means, but, but whatever we think um, around globalization, uh, one uh, bad phenomenon was what I think is that, uh, that globalization was used as a kind of a tool by big powers uh, to spread in a very aggressive way their political narrative or their, their political approach. So those who um, have been representing somewhat different than international mainstream have been judged, criticized, stigmatized, and kind of pushed out from different forms of uh, cooperation. And, and I think that was, that was really an unfavorable, a bad phenomenon, which didn't help the global uh, cooperation. So what we have a fear about is that we are coming to a stage of global confrontation based on uh, geographic blocks instead of uh, global uh, cooperation. So if you ask me how we should um, uh, 
press or push the uh, the reset button. I think there will be three issues which could be game changers for the future. Number one, whether mutual respect will return to international political relations or not. Because unfortunately, in the recent period of time, we have seen a total lack of mutual um, uh, respect. Second, whether everybody would understand that physical reality cannot be overwritten either by political approach or by uh, ideology. And number three, whether the communication channels will be kept open among those who are not very happy to talk to each other. Because if the communication channels are being closed, then I think we give up the hope for peace or we give up the hope for a uh, pragmatic, normal um, uh, global cooperation, which might be called in another terms globalization. I want to push you quickly on something other than the follow up there, given what you've just said, which is, of course, to the extent that there is a Cold War coming, and I would argue it's worse than a Cold War, yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. then, I mean, Hungary's at least on the right side of it in the sense that you're in the European Union. But it's hard to, hard to argue that there's a block in the sense that with the Cold War, you know, East versus West, this is kind of Russia. Belarus is kind of Russia. But aside from that, there ain't much going on. So is, are you talking just about the isolation of Russia, or are you talking more broadly about a, a global phenomenon that, that also has implications? Well, I, I totally agree with you that uh, how it looks now, what is coming might be much worse than Cold War used to be. I totally uh, agree with you, especially from our perspective, because I understand that from hundreds or thousands of kilometers away, it looks different, but Russia is part of reality. And the closer you are, geographically uh, speaking to Russia, the more it is a reality and more impact it does have, regardless of the fact that you are belonging to another integration, as we are belonging both to NATO and the European Union. But Russia is a reality there, not to speak about the energy issues and all others. So what I say is that channels of communication should be kept open, especially putting into consideration that you might be right that the other side, let's put it this way, what you spoke about is not a monolithic block, but I'm not quite sure that when it comes to a question either or, uh, then, um, uh, then there, would, that there would not be many countries joining the other side. I mean, so my fear is that at the end of the day, it artificially, although, but it can be uh, formed uh, as a uh, isolation or division between two monolithic blocks, which definitely should be prevented somehow. Okay, very good. So, um, two uh, interesting little discussion we had on the chip war and technology in the context of this. And especially as we're forward looking here, I want to get into technology because it is true that the US, at least in terms of you know, high-end semiconductors, is trying very hard to create a policy of containment vis-a-vis -vis China yeah. and intends to get allies on board and so far has had some success. As we look forward over the next 10 years, and you're talking of a new cocktail, I wonder to what extent that one of the biggest pieces of deglobalization is algorithmic. In other words, I mean, if you've got 1.4 billion people in China who are everything they see, interact with, um, including the economy, is intermediated by a set of Chinese algorithms that are completely different from the algorithms that we are engaging with. On mm -hmm. Is that going to drive a piece of deglobalization, or is that really irrelevant to the conversation? Doesn't matter, or maybe not even happening. Um, let me let you respond to that. And, and if you want, also talk a little bit about other trends in technology that you think are going to change the way we think about globalization. And Adam, I'll let you start since you brought it up. Well, I mean, I really, I, I like the way you develop the argument, right? The, the, the story, even if we grant that there is this deliberate effort on the American side to uncouple China at the high end of chips, right? That then produces all of these follow-on reactions, part of which then is a desperate Chinese struggle to find new ways of building their own ecosystem, moved by Chinese corporates into new physical spaces, all of which fall under the rubric of globalization, where one can find oneself agreeing with Neil that this could end up just being a statistical chimera. And in the meantime, we have Taiwanese companies contemplating major FDI in you know, unlikely parts of the United States, which are aspects of you know, a kind of re-globalization, you could say, of bits of Texas or Ohio or whatever. So that this is not a, it, you cannot be reduced to a, to a no, seriously, I mean, no, the, you're you know, right. it's large parts of the American workforce that. are going to be expected to conform to Taiwanese standards, uh, uh, which is going to be a huge shock. Uh, when, that, when, that, when that happens. Algorithmically, 
I think it's going to be interesting. If TikTok's, I'm not a big TikTok person, but if TikTok's anything to go by. Shocking to me, by the way. It, yes. I, it, well, yeah. People say we'd be good on it. I'm sure Neil would be fantastic on TikTok. But, but, um, You'd be amazed to hear that I uh, won't have anything to do with it. I no, no, I've heard is. you on it, but I'm just saying that the, the persona would work, would, would work really well. But the, it's not obvious to me. That was that, damning by faint praise. Yes, so, it is. So, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. The algorithms don't necessarily stay within you know, their intended political or cultural sphere. I mean, that would seem to be an export. Or the effective algorithms that sit within K-pop, for instance, is another phenomenon of this type. I mean, that's algorithmic music, if there ever was algorithmic music. It's machine produced, mm -hmm. effectively. And it's hugely quaffable all over the world. So I'd be skeptical about the enclosure, but the basic, I mean, I see your basic point, but it doesn't seem to me to predict Clearly a deep Ian, can I make a suggestion here? Sure. Uh, which is between the distinction that seems relevant to me is between software and hardware. Yep. Software uh, and platforms will continue to globalize. I, I struggle to imagine the US, in fact, banning TikTok. Uh, so I think, and, and K pop will continue to proliferate. Um, my 11-year-old son makes me listen to it on, on the school run. Actually, it's, BTS is quite good. It's sort of Motown, but with strange accents. Um, so I think the software piece just goes on globalizing. And you can see that if you look at the data on, on band, cross-border bandwidth. It just keeps growing. And I think that, that trend will continue. And there'll be some cognitive dissonance, because the world of hardware will be quite different. Because the world of hardware is, is the domain of Cold War II. And the United States has a strategy of technological containment. It's a bit like in the three-body problem, where uh, the Trisolarans try to halt the technological advance of Earth. Uh, that's exa exactly what the US is trying to do to so China. The Chinese sci-fi book that came out uh, a few years yeah, ago. Everybody yeah, everybody should read it. Yeah. And, and I think it, 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 it's so far going quite well, because it's not obvious to me that, that China has a shot at replicating TSMC mm. Uh, on the mainland. It doesn't really have a chance of capturing it because it would just be a pile of rubble if they invaded Taiwan. So in the realm of hardware, Cold War II is going to be, be real and it will get more clear. There are going to be two uh, blocks in the realm of hardware. The great Eurasian block that in some ways the sanctions against Russia uh, are accelerating the formation of is going to be one uh, world in uh, and, and the other world is going to be an American-led world with allies in Europe, but even more important allies actually in, in Asia. And the, the interesting thing about this, and I want to pick up on something that you said, is that there is a clear risk that Cold War II becomes a hot war. That's what's scary about it. Because if you make Taiwan the focal point, it's much, much more of a dangerous focal point than Cuba was mm. in 1962. Mm. So it seems to me that at the heart of this strategy, although it sounds technocratic, we'll just stop them having high-end semiconductors, you were in fact creating an obvious casus belli, which is the future of Taiwan. In other words, the Americans are doing more to change the fundamental status quo on Taiwan. Um, than the Chinese have uh, over the past The Chinese years. wanted globalization to keep going because it was really working for them. Yeah. And that's why Xi Jinping would come to Davos and they would talk about win-win when you went to Beijing. And they would take it if, if the United States suddenly proposed detente. But the United States is not going to propose detente because there's a bipartisan consensus in favor of the containment of China. And that's why Cold War is the reality. Feel free, come on in. Yeah, I'd like to. So I'd like to come back to um, the, the the chips war and sure. a point Neil made about competition over hardware, because I think the lines between government and business are being redrawn mm -hmm. in a way that's going to spill over into other sectors of business. So in the tech sector, we can see companies being offered on the positive side a kind of national purpose, a role in national security and national competition being offered investments and backing by government. But let's not forget that in practice, when that means big government subsidies, uh, tariffs and trade protectionisms, um, and the, the, the language of friend shoring, that it can go one of two ways. The East Asian Tigers showed us that it can be fantastically successful when the national purpose is existential, when the investment flows are incredibly focused on economic growth, and when you've had a war which has reset your, your society and made a society of real opportunity.
In other words, that combinate that new industrial policy can be extraordinarily successful. But let's not forget that in most of the rest of the world, it created bloated, entitled white elephants and businesses that didn't work, that just became rent seekers. And I think that's pretty important because it might just be hardware, but actually it's not just hardware. It's rapidly moving. Is it PPE masks? Mm -hmm. Is it um, pharmaceuticals? Is it earth? Is it minerals and resources? I think the, the, the sense that um, national security now requires a new relationship <laughs> between governments and business is one that every sector of business needs to be watching closely. Peter, and you want to talk about China a little uh, bit in the context. Actually, about um, the, um, the efforts now, which are there around in, let's say, the western part of the world to decouple the western economies uh, from China, which I think will not function. And uh, I can um, rely on our own national uh, experience. You know, in Hungary, the, um, the backbone of national economy is the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. Around 30 to 35, 30 to 33 percent of the output from industry comes from the automotive industry. And now we are putting a lot of efforts in becoming the European hub for the electric transition. So to be a hub of Europe when it comes to the um, electric uh, automobile uh, sector. So far, we are number three in the world when it comes to production of uh, electric batteries. And now the biggest electric battery factory of Europe is started to be constructed in Hungary. And guess what? This is Chinese. Uh, seven out of the top 10 companies in the world when it comes to the production of electric batteries are Chinese. The other three are Korean, so there are no Western ones there. And if you look at the um, Western or European, uh, Western European uh, uh, automotive companies, they have been basically putting most of their eggs in the basket of electrification. Namely that from 2030 or from the 2030s, they want to phase out um, the uh, cars with, um, with the traditional powertrain from mm -hmm. their own uh, uh, portfolio and focus on electric. But if they focus on electric, an electric car doesn't make sense without having an electric battery. And electric batteries are being produced by the Chinese and the Koreans, so what happens? they need to couple themselves instead of the efforts of, of decoupling. In case of Hungary, we are the only country next to Germany and China where the three German top premium car makers are having or will be having factory. They all put their electric efforts, the, one of their heart of electric efforts into Hungary. And uh, the number one, number six, and number seven uh, electric battery companies from China and Korea respectively are in Hungary as well. And the CEOs of the Western European companies keep on calling me to bring more of their Chinese suppliers, mm. electric battery manufacturers and part manufacturers to Hungary to be as close as possible uh, to them because this is the secret and the key to their uh, success. So while on a political level, I see strong efforts, at least in communication, to decouple the economies, on, on, the, on, on, on the reality mm -hmm. level, on the physical reality level, on the corporate level, I see a very strong coupling. And we in Hungary, yeah. as being in the middle, this is one of the advantages, being in the middle, that, that we can be, a, and we are already a meeting point for well, the Germans and, fair, and the Chinese. And to be fair, not just on the corporate level, if you talk to governments, non-American governments, I mean, even Japanese Prime Minister Kishida wants a dramatically tighter national security relationship with the U.S., but he also wants more exposure to the Chinese market. Yeah. He wants that. The South Koreans want that. The Europeans want that. Schultz obviously wants that. Macron. So, I mean, to the extent the Russians are isolated um, geopolitically from the West because of their behavior, the Americans as a government, the private sector and all the allies don't want to be forced to choose between the U.S. and China. That, that is a break on the kind of decoupling you're talking about. No, that's, that's but right, but right. You, bring up, you bring us from technology to global supply chains and also energy. And the shift, dramatic shift, um, from fossil fuels through transition to what comes next. And I'm wondering, I'd love to hear whoever wants to come in first, feel free, um, it, what we think the implications are as we have very different countries that have critical nodes in supply chain, of which China is obviously one when we talk about critical minerals, um, as well as a much more decentralized uh, uh, energy platforms that are post-carbon compared to what we've seen around oil and gas. Who'd like to start with that? 
Well, let's again not exaggerate uh, what's changing. Yep. Uh, the more people talk about green new deals and green transitions, the less they happen. Two years ago, you would have been a mug to invest in ESG. You would have been smart to invest in coal. So the law of unintended consequences is very powerful. A lot of the policies that governments have adopted to try and accelerate decarbonisation have actually been backfiring quite badly. Uh, and I think we, we, again, exaggerate the speed with which this transition will happen, uh, uh, partly because we come to Davos and we, or we talk to Europeans and we get the impression that what happens here really matters. But what happens in China matters much more. Uh, and, you know, in the time since Greta Thunberg's birth, China's responsible for about 85 percent of the increase in coal consumption and about two thirds of the increase in CO2 emissions. So I don't think there's as much change in the energy space as people would like to see, particularly people who come uh, to Davos. Again, there's enormous inertia. For the same reason that globalization is hard to kill, you know, even if you want to kill it, even if you say, I'm against globalization, think of all those governments. Uh, you know, Chris Liddell's here, was part of the Trump administration. There was a real sustained effort to push back uh, and use a variety of different policy tools to push back. And, if you look at the US-China bilateral trade deficit, it moved a bit, but not that much. Globalization is hard to kill, what I called Chimerica back in 2007, for the reasons you just gave, Peter. It's incredibly resilient. It's also really hard to get the world off fossil fuels. I mean, we're trying, but we haven't really got very far, is the harsh reality. And in that sense, I think a puzzle will be for future historians why did North America, not just the US, why did North America not take advantage of the opportunity that presented itself? Why in the end did they let Saudi uh, remain the swing producer when they could really have ramped up production and reduced the, the dominance of OPEC? I don't think the world has changed as much as we think it's changing in this respect. Adam may disagree. I know you're working on this, Adam. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, before we go to Adam, though, and I'm going to go to you in a second, um, I just want to let you know we will have time for one or two questions. Good questions, tight questions, think about them, and I'll, I'll be looking to call on you, Adam. Well, I, mean, I think even if you don't concede Neil's like full status quo thesis about the world, even if we admit it. No, inertia, the, not status quo. Yeah, it's no, shifting, but, but it's shifting. But, but much allow, more slowly. allow the energy transition to happen, then I think your other claim, namely that globalization trends will in fact continue in various ways, would still obtain. Sure. Right? Yeah, because absolutely. the effect of the energy transition is essentially to create a new set of interdependencies. Absolutely. And, and they're going to be quite adventurous and quite interesting and definitely reach out beyond the boundaries of, say, the Euro European bloc or even the North American bloc. So Europe, anyway, its energy transition has to be interconnected. And there's a lot of extremely excited talk about connections there, Africa, for instance, which would rely on cheap solar, most of which would effectively come from China and the battery technologies as well. So I I would see that as one of the forces driving towards a new cocktail narrative of globalization rather than simple continuity, but certainly not a story that drives towards regionalization or a total unbundling of, you know, of, of, uh, or disintegration of the world economy. It's a new set of connections of the shape, very rapidly as well. So we would disagree there, but I think the overall impact is one to just remix the cocktail. That's but good, I, I think that the, the somewhat kind of uh, negative um, uh, tone of this, which is which is absolutely right in describing the status quo, just pushes me to think. So, what is what is really required now on the energy transition? And the thing that's missing is clear, permanent government goalposts. In other words, not governments trying to go and do house cladding and and solar panels themselves. But governments doing the one minimum thing that governments need to do, whether it's the Chinese government, the European <coughs> Union government, African governments, or the American government, and that's to set the rules that create an ecosystem for every company in the world to then make excellent decisions on the energy transition. You know, first, obviously, a carbon price, not a pretend price, but a real carbon price. That, that companies can know is not going to change. Companies need to know that the goalposts won't shift every year or every three years or every election cycle. So and I think that's the, that's the one thing about the energy transition that we now absolutely have to set our minds to. We shouldn't let it become a partisan football. If one government's going to legislate a carbon price and the whole private sector knows that the next election will bring a government that unravels that, it's impossible to make the kinds of investments that are required for the energy transition. So now is a moment 
not, I think, to criticise all the little things that governments aren't doing, but rather to focus governments on all sides of the geopolitical competition on the one or two clearest, simplest things that they need to put in place for every other stakeholder in the world to start making decisions that take us towards an energy transition. Peter, you want to come in? Yeah, well, I think the, the biggest problem here is, uh, according to our understanding at least, that green became an ideology instead of a real attempt to protect the environment. And I think that the game changer will be whether nuclear will be adopted as a green and sustainable way of generating electricity or not. In Hungary, as I told you, we are uh, not rich in natural resources. We don't want to ruin our um, environment either. That's why we do believe in nuclear. We are now uh, doubling the nuclear capacity of the country. We have a more than 40 year long experience with using nuclear, which considered or which proved to be a cheap, safe, green, sustainable way of generating energy. Uh, millions of tons of CO2 emission is being prevented. Billions of cubic meters of imported gas is being avoided with nuclear. But as long as there's an ideological debate about what is green and what is not, and not a professional one, I think uh, this whole um, principle or oral uh, idea of green transition might fail. So I think if we can come back to a professional uh, way of discussion instead of the discussion about ideologies, then we might be successful. Where do you turn to the audience? I've got two I see. Sir, go right ahead. We'll get you a microphone, and then I'll try to get to you too. So try to be tight and get two questions. Uh, it's a question for the Hungarian minister. Um, you essentially, you are saying that uh, Hungary is going to become essential for the car industry in Europe. Uh, but Hungary is also not a fully free country according to Freedom House. So uh, is your message that uh, in the end you become essential and it must be a deal with Europe uh, that Europe should accept a different political model in Hungary uh, even as it is an essential country for the industry in Europe? I'm hoping the next question will actually be a globalization question, but you can certainly have a tight response to it. Yes. Kind of uh, question of globalization. Uh, look, uh, since uh, we have been in office, since 2010, this political debate uh, has been around. Definitely our government uh, does not represent uh, uh, what is being represented by international liberal mainstream. Definitely we are a right-wing, patriotic, uh, Christian democratic government, which is uh, not, a, uh, uh, not a usual uh, phenomenon currently in Europe. Uh, but uh, one thing must be respected, that this government has won the last four elections with landslide, which means that whatever we are doing is based on the will of the people. And the question what democracy is, we do believe that democracy means that you fulfill the will of the people. And this government definitely does it. We understand it's not a liberal government, so the liberal mainstream will always criticize us. This is something that we had to live with. I feel like we have probably not advanced that conversation very far. Sorry, sir, no, that's you. quite all right. Uh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> tight answer. That's no, what you, tight that's answer. Good. That's what I want. Is it tight answer? It's true. Hello. Oh, I'm wondering if you think it's possible to have globalization and decentralization at the same time. And we, are you talking specifically about the energy field or more broadly political? More broadly political. Okay, sure. Who wants to? Yeah, that's a I'm good not, question. Because I thought that was a really interesting point that you make now about yeah. hegemony. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I agree that hegemony is crucial to globalization. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ways of describing the new cocktail is that it's in fact a more polycentric form of globalization that we're heading towards, mm -hmm. in which as it were, there may indeed be a rupture in the Chimerica model, which was the two great powers of the world, as it were, locked together. But that isn't going to obviate or even retard. In some ways, it may even accelerate regional logics of integration, which would fit your model of decentralization, right? And are not amenable to or necessarily dependent on yeah. the dollar-based system, for instance, yeah. right? They still may use offshore dollars to do units of account and stores of wealth, but the, the, I think that's actually a rather a good way of encapsulating what I would see the next 10 years as about, is, yeah. is, a, is a sort of decentralized, polycentric, to use the poly word again, uh, globalization. And I, I agree, and I, I think it's a great question. Um, and we've already seen a certain decentralization in finance. 
where individually countries have amassed their own foreign exchange reserves and, and, and swaps agreements to give them resilience. Mm. And then regionally, they've created deeper arrangements in several continents. And that's why the financial crisis, which is upon us at the moment, has been slowed by these resilience <laughs> measures that have been taken. And I think we are seeing signs that that's going to flow over into trade. And that that's actually something that I, I think is very good. It's good for one vital thing, which is competition across the global economy um, in, a, in a world which looks very monopolistic. Yeah, to give a concrete example, think about the way the Gulf states are sponsoring both Egypt and Pakistan, which makes Egypt and Pakistan relatively less dependent on the IMF, for instance. We'll see how, if, to what extent they actually are able to really fill the challenges. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, yeah. I, I have to say from a historian's vantage point, the first age of globalization was pretty inseparable from a British imperial yeah. hegemony. And the second age, if you want to call it that, had a lot to do with the American commitment after World War II with increasing uh, uh, conviction into the 1980s that there should be a world of free trade uh, and then increasingly free capital movements and migration. And when the US lost faith in that vision, uh, then I think we, we had a kind of hinge point Ultimately, globalization is dr driven to an enormous extent by the great powers of the world. When they essentially agreed on it, you know, when China joined the WTO, you had peak globalization. Uh, that was the age of Chimerica. Now that we're in Cold War II, you end up with really two global orders, one, which, one of which is US-led, the other of which is, is Chinese-led. And while Americans explicitly use America first, it's one of the most astonishing continuities between the last administration and the Biden administration. The Chinese implicitly believe in China first. The Chinese will make policy, we, kn we know this, in order to prioritize the dominance of the CCP. And anything that poses a threat to that gets jettisoned. And that is why, when it comes to questions of, of climate policy, the priorities of the CCP will not be to halt global warming. The priority will be to preserve the position of the CCP. A growth rate of 3%, which is what they had last year, isn't sufficient for the stability of that regime. They'll do whatever it takes to avoid a further diminution of that growth rate, which will be hard now their population is shrinking. Breaking news. By the way, before I turn to Peter, Cold War II is like fetch. No matter how many times you say it, you can't make it occur since we're picking on titles. Uh, Peter. Well, uh, you know, we in Hungary say Hungary first, so I mean, for us it's... Uh, Everybody it's, says it's, that, it's, right? It's, it's, it's not an insult that uh, President Trump said America first. It was kind of natural um, uh, for us. He was the first one who, say, who said that. Actually, everybody acted accordingly, but he said it at least. He was honest. So it, it, just one, one uh, sentence uh, in, in, in this regard. When we speak about decentralization, if we mean under that uh, taking into account the national specificities, I think this is a must. So I can't um, foresee any global cooperative system without taking into consideration the national or the regional specificities. So very different perspectives on the panel, but don't panic. Uh, sober, analytic, not cable news headlines from your crazy uncle. Uh, globalization is moving. It is shifting course. Uh, it is not falling apart. I think we can all agree on that. Thank you for attending. And we look forward to seeing you over the course of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.